We're going to stage a keynote conversation because we like to challenge academic form. So it's quite fun. Um, I'm just going to read off some introductions of the folks here who I, in many ways, don't need much introducing. Um, but I'll try nonetheless. And then you guys can take it away. Okay, so Donna Haraway is Distinguished Professor Emerita in the History of Consciousness Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her work explores the string figure knots tied by feminist theory, science and technology studies, and animal studies. She earned her PhD in biology at Yale in 1972, and she taught biology at the University of Hawaii and the his and history of science at the Johns Hopkins University. Her books include When Species Meet, Crystals, Fabrics, and Fields, Metaphors That Shape em Embryos, Primate Visions, Gender, Race, and Nature in the World of Modern Science, Simeon, Cyborgs, and Women, The Reinvention of Nature, and I've never had to read this out loud. Modest Witness, that's just what I'm going to call it. <laughs> um, Coward. <laughs> the Companion Species Manifesto, Dogs, People, and Significant Otherness, and The Haraway Reader. And Donna was also my advisor and she's truly an incredible mentor. Eduardo Cohn is an assistant professor of anthropology at McGill University. Oh, I kind of invented this for you, Eduardo. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> now she can. His research is concerned with human-animal relations and the implications that ethnographic study of these relationships can have for rethinking anthropology. Semicolon. The empirical context for this work is his ongoing long-term research on how the, the Quechua, speaking Runa, of Ecuador's upper Amazon inhabit the tropical forest and engage with its beings. He is the author of How Forests Think Towards an Anthropology Beyond the Human, forthcoming. And like really forthcoming, right? Yeah, like September. Imminent arrival. OK. Um, Colin Diane is the Robert Penn Warren Professor in the Humanities and Professor of English at Vanderbilt University. She is also the author of Fables of Mind, an Inquiry into Post Fiction, Haiti History and the Gods, The Story of Cruel and Unusual, I may have cut something off there. And most recently, um, The Law is a White Dog, which we have um, more fancy blurbs about. It's just a really wonderful book, um, which was selected as a top 25, quote, outstanding academic book of 2011. She was recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. All right. So this is our plan. Uh, each of us is going to take 10 minutes to propose uh, a situated story that somehow gets at the way worlding happens where living and dying are at stake with other critters and ourselves. Then we're going to ask each other questions and talk to each other for about a half hour. And then we're going to open it up um, so that it's an, a, a kind of enlarging set, or a set of, th of string figures or patterns. And I am particularly happy to be set up in this kind of conversation, this kind of keynote conversation with Eduardo and Colin in particular, because I have felt uh, profoundly informed and shaped by them for each of them for a long time um, around questions of dispossession and the law and what it is to be um, uh, inter interpolated into personhood and non-personhood uh, under conditions of dispossession and conquest. What it is both, which both Eduardo and Colin's work um, in relation to other animals and also in relation to people have been situated, both of them have, have had their work situated in that context. And both have also been profoundly um, consumed with questions, uh, uh, questions of semiosis, se semiotics, language, communication, both representational and not. Um, with questions of um, making meaning uh, across the profound differences of species, of conquest, of history, um, of, uh, of worlding. So that I was privileged to blurb each of their recent books uh, and therefore made collections of quotes in order to do these little commercial acts uh, of promotion. Now, uh, the ways that we shape each other through communication really are quite endless. <laughs> okay, so 
again, informed also by another one of us who is not here, but who is part of this larger community, Tom Van Doren, who is part of the Australian Ecological Humanities World, and who with Debbie Bird Rose asks a particularly powerful set of questions of what it is to write in a time of extinctions, exterminations, and I add genocides, and permanent war. What it is to write, what it is to world uh, in a time of, of profound iterate, iterative extinctions and exterminations, which I believe is the situation um, of, of living and dying, of flourishing and failing to flourish that joins animals and other critters on this planet together these days. We call this love at our peril. You know, uh, that, that the, uh, the questions that often come under the label of the Anthropocene, that is to say, uh, the accelerated rates of extinction, the accelerated writing, writing into the waters, into the earth itself, into the fossil record, into the gases, into the species assemblages, into the molecules, the accelerated writing of the earth um, in uh, accelerated extinctions and accelerated threats of, of uh, serious system collapse tr uh, of all sorts truly is the situation in which human beings and other critters must figure out how to ask each other how or if to go on. Uh, these are not sentimental questions, though I'm not against sentiment, nor against the sentimental novel as a rhetorical form. I think it is underrated uh, as a rhetorical form. There's much to be said. But the question that joins us today uh, is, I think, posed by Tom Van Doren and Debbie Rose. What is it to write in a time of extinctions and exterminations and iterative conquests and permanent war and genocides at all sorts of scales that include other critics? mind you, I am not saying animals, that include other critters uh, as well as human beings. Um, other critters are an indefinite category. Uh, they, they certainly include beings that are not usually considered animals uh, and don't depend on criteria of consciousness, whether hierarchically considered or not, but do depend on issues of semioses, which Eduardo will get at in a book, uh, How Forests Think, not do forests think, as if it were still a question, but how they think, and then he goes about for many hundred pages, actually rather few and, and disciplined, few hundred pages, to outline precisely how forests think. Uh, he and Ursula Le Guin uh, understand how forests think. Avatar doesn't have a clue. <laughs> actually does have a clue, it's pretty good in a lot of ways. Um, now, Tom has also written another recent book, which is an absent presence for my 10 minutes, and it's called Flightways. And I want to plagiarize shamelessly from his little piece on whooping cranes in his new book, Flightways, which will be appearing any minute now, but I also got to blurb it and so knew about it in advance. Blurbing is a great way uh, <laughs> to um, be fed. I, I'm believe, I mean, talk about treats. Dogs have no idea what it's like to be fed uh, by the, in, in the really vital work of one's colleagues. And all you have to turn in is a little piece of commercial prose um, you know, to get your liver treat. So anyway, Tom Van Doren's Flightways in his Whooping Crane traf uh, chapter, he asked throughout that book, what is it to hold open space for others in a time of accelerated extinctions? Where extinction is not an uh, a uh, punctual event, but an extended temporality. There is not an edge of extin extinction so much as a shelf of extinction. Extinction is a protracted process. It's not a single event. Okay? So what is it if, if a mode of responsibility among us is to figure out how to hold open space mm -hmm. for another, for each other, for us, somehow getting on together where the us isn't all human and perhaps even humans aren't human in any way that we know how to recognize properly. What is it to hold open space for another? Mm -hmm. That's the ethical question mm -hmm. uh, that consumes me these days. And he asks it in relation to whooping cranes. And he does it by asking uh, with a searing detail uh, what it costs to be a value in a species recovery program, which the whooping crane is. Okay? Who's, uh, which female whooping cranes are in lifelong captivity so as to accelerate their egg production 
such that their eggs can be incubated by a non-endangered species, in this case the sandhill cranes, such that human beings dressed as sort of odd looking whooping cranes so as to prevent imprinting because of the uh, knowledge since Conrad Lorenz that to allow other critters to imprint on you is an act of violence that will shape their reproductive histories for failure forever after. That will, that will shape them behaviorally in such a way that they will um, forever after have uh, a kind of sociality that sets them up for giant trouble unless the human being remains accountable to them for life, which very, human being, very few human beings, not counting our rabbit lady, who <laughs> really inspires me, she is capable of being responsible for life in my view. Very few people are. You know, uh, in terms of the critters that we take on uh, into our lives, are we really responsible to them for as long as it takes? Big question. Okay. So, um, if human beings have learned not to let other critters imprint. Uh, responsible human beings, good scientists in this case, have learned to try to block imprinting, even as they are raising baby birds for release in this thing called the wild, which is a highly managed. I mean, what are, what are critters going to be released into is no small question on the, on the shelf of extinction. I wish, our, I wish Jake Metcalf hadn't had to stay away this morning and had talked about the de-extinction with the passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon released into what? What sort of world is a species recovery plan about, whether it's for an extinct species or an extant, extant species, including each other, okay, and the, our kinds of invulnerability? For what? is futurity being produced? What kinds of future, futures? So little possible habitats are tested by releasing again sandhill cranes or other birds to subject them to the resident predators to see how well they survive before the reproductively highly valued birds, the endangered species critters, could be risked in such an environment because their deaths as kind are what's at stake. So that an extraordinary workforce of human beings, scientists dressed up like whooping cranes, um, I'm really you know, condensing a very complicated and fascinating story, including scientists who build little light flyers uh, and fly migratory whooping cranes on their first, first migratory flights so they know where to go f following these little light flyers. You know, um, you remember the popular film that was released a few years ago. Well, these, the, the, the amount of, the, the, the extraordinary uh, inventiveness and creativity and vitality and ethical, uh, ethical commitment and suffering and love that goes into building the technologies that might just maybe produce some futures for critters that otherwise wouldn't have them. But in the course of doing that are quite clear that they are involved in practice of extracted labor, coerced reproduction, multiple kinds of killing as well as nurturing. Um, who will live and who will die in a species recovery plan is a very carefully worked out matter. Okay? So is a species recovery plan a good thing to do? Well, that's a situated question of great complexity, right? For whom? At what cost? Who lives and dies? What kind of future is opened up? Whose sorts of lives and deaths? I dare any responsible critter person to be a pro-life activist. I dare you, anyone to do it. One cannot approach these questions from a philosophical premise of pro-life. No, any more than one can approach the relatively simple question of human pregnancy. Seven billion and counting sterilizes all. Never mind, I didn't say that. Uh, <laughs> um, I am on a tear these days about babies. It really, I, I'm not saying this, forget it. Um, but I, well, anyway, but I am serious <laughs> about not regarding reproductive freedom as the be-all and the end-all of thinking ethically, even about feminist questions of reproductive freedom, much less about what we owe the other critters if we're serious about opening up space on this, on the edge of the, of ex the on the multiple forms of, of um, accelerated killing that are afoot among us. Okay. So that's my big picture. That's, used, that's plagiarizing from Tom Van Doren to ask a really complicated question by telling you what it takes to fledge a whooping crane chick. 
Okay, how much surrogate uh, surrogate reproductive labor? How many whooping cranes subjected to accelerated ovulation, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. What does it take to open up a future for an endangered species? Big question. Okay. Now, little question, little story to end my piece of this has to do with a trip I took in the Southwest with my dog, Cayenne, who is all too well trained. You think you're embarrassed by not being a good dog, dog trainer. The shame that comes from being a good dog trainer, <laughs> I'll match any day. <laughs> um, it, I, I only half teasing. Um, Ms. Goody Goody and me and my husband went on a car trip. And Ms. Goody Goody, who is an agility performer, uh, and who earned her championship in agility and who taught me an incredible number of shameful things over the dozen years we competed with each other. Taught me about breakdown, power, sadism, pleasure, joy. I'll tell you, uh, the lessons are really uh, endless. And she also taught me about whom I admire in dog worlds, which is to say the folks who actually figure out how to live with their actual dogs as opposed to their fantasy dogs or they're actual rabbits, or they're actual horses, or they're actual crickets. The people who actually get redone by having made a life-changing commitment that is not optional to somebody who is not you. Mm -hmm. um, I think parents occasionally do that, but rarely. Uh, <laughs> I just think it's goddamn hard. <laughs> uh, and I'm not calling it love, it's something else. Um, so the, the folks who actually learned in agility, this really weird competition that involves thousands of hours of training, actually learned to run with their actual dogs as opposed to their fantasy dogs, those people got my, my respect in spades. Okay. So there's Cayenne and me and, and my husband person uh, um, at the Hopi Cultural Center on Second Mesa in the parking lot. And I under, I've read Creatures of Empire. I know that Cayenne's ancestors herded sheep in U.S. conquest territory after the Civil War and that the whole reason Australian Shepherds exist, by the way, they're an American dog, not an Australian dog, the whole reason they exist is to herd the commercial sheep that replace the Spanish rough sheep, the churro sheep. I know about the extermination of the Navajo churro sheep in the 1930s and the progressive New Deal era erosion control under carrying capacity ideologies that trumped us role. I know too much. Okay, so there's Cayenne and me, both white creatures of empire. She is, of course, also white, which <laughs> helps, but you know, really Ms. Goody Goody and her dog, creatures of empire in the parking lot, you know, in the Hopi Cultural Center, and I'm saying, what would constitute good manners to walk around the villages with my dog on leash, or is it just plain bad manners? Because I wanted to be polite. And the guy at the Hopi Cultural Center is really amazing. He, look, he says, well, you know, he says, it's really not about the people. They're perfectly fine with you walking around with your dog and, you know, whatever. He says, it's actually about the reservation. It's actually about the other dogs. Because they are not on leash, as you can plainly see in the parking lot. And your dog doesn't have the cultural savvy to hang out with these dogs and their cultural savvy. They're not especially aggressive. They're not going to hurt you. Everybody is saying there are way too many of these dogs. No one admits to owning them, but a whole lot of people are feeding them because they, they were to a dog rather pudgy. You know, my dog's ribs show to the exact degree of millimeter depth for a healthy athletic dog. You know, I mean, she's been subjected to every health discourse in sight. <laughs> these dogs were fat, goddammit, and nobody, <laughs> nobody admitted to owning them, you know. <laughs> And furthermore, they're unemployed because the Hopi are buying their sheep dung from the Navajo who are by and large aren't raising too many sheep because cattle are more profitable. And a whole lot of things are going on, you know? And there we are in the parking lot with these fat reservation dogs uh, whose puppies by and large don't make it. They don't recruit their own populations because their puppies by and large don't make it because they get eaten by coyotes and killed by ravens and uh, they won't make it through the winter and one thing and another. But, you know, if you make it, you are sitting pretty. So what I'm really doing, this is the end of my story. This one actually ends with being a creature of empire never ends. There was Cayenne and me and the guy in the Hopi Cultural Center and the craft person with the craft booth and those particular dogs who no one claimed to have names for, but I don't believe it for a minute. I just didn't know their names. Um, the, the, the story of the iterative inheriting, uh, inheriting being um, living in a white settler colony, 
uh, where uh, sovereignty issues are absolutely still very much being lived out and re-seized and where the dogs are part of that conversation too. And so that um, the, the herding dog of the Conquest West and the reservation dogs who look like kind of purebred time, purebred F1, none of them was going to make it as a Navajo herding dog. These were all, um, these were dogs who, who had more than a nodding acquaintance with the AKC in their lineage ancestry, these reservation dogs, I assure you. Uh, they were, quote, much close quote of the F1 generation for the most part, uh, or even of uh, the first generation, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if they were abandoned, I, they didn't look abandoned to me, or needing rescue by anybody. Um, and I know their puppies are largely only eaten by ravens and coyotes, whatever. I'm saying that my sense of curiosity, embarrassment, tourism, knowledge, deciding whether the dogs are going to get to meet each other or not, this is the ongoing inheriting of being a member of a white settler colony that is full of all sorts of people who aren't white settlers, thank you. Uh, that it on goes, that it isn't over, and that it's really interesting, and the devil is in the details. Mm -hmm. That's it. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna, I want to build on this question that you were circulating in our, in our emails, building up here, and I'll just repeat it, what you've already mentioned it, but uh, this question that Donna asked both of us, what does it mean to hold open space for other living beings in times of extermination, extinction, extinction and genocide? And my response is to ask, how can thinking with forests help us think about this? Um, as Harlan mentioned, I've been working for some time in a region of Ecuador's upper Amazon with the Quechua speaking Runa, uh, who live quite intimately with um, a whole host of creatures um, in the forest animals, plants, fungi, but also spirits, ghosts, and the dead. Um, and all of these, in some ways, people one of the densest thickets of life on our planet. Um, and so that's sort of, you know, where I'm coming from in my remarks. Um, and I want to sort of preface this by saying that we anthropologists or social theorists or humanists, or critical theorists, we've gotten really smart at thinking with other people. Um, that's our, that's what we do, what, what we've done. Um, but these other people that, uh, other people actually think with the world. Um, and part of that world thinks. Uh, the living world also thinks. So my work for the past few years have, has been concerned with exploring ethnographically um, how it is, and I mean this quite literally, that forests think. And how we can learn to open ourselves to these sylvan thoughts. Um, in ways that change our thoughts, including our thoughts about what it means to think. So my interest is in what I call an anthropology beyond the human. Um, and I do, I'm interested in this anthropology beyond the human um, in large part by exploring thought beyond the human. So in addressing Donna's prompt, um, I want to think about two things today. First, the, the first thing I want to think about is how can thinking beyond the human change our understandings of relationality. And the second thing I want to uh, think about um, is how do multi-species relations become important sites for cultivating an ethical practice? So these are the two things I want to I think about today. So first, just a very, very brief uh, two-second background concerning how I think about relation. I'll develop this a little bit more in my brief paper tomorrow, um, but here goes. We can't think about relation without thinking about representation because re relational ties are semiotic ones. That sounds really weird, um, but it's actually not controversial. Whether or not we're explicit about it, we already see relation as representation. We, academics, social scientists, humanists, we already see relation as representation because human language is our model for understanding relationality whether or not we admit it or not. Um, whether we think in terms of social, cultural, historical, or discursive contexts, hidden genealogies, or even the networks of an actor network theory, the relation, contingent, conventional, systemic, co-constructed, 
is always like that among words in human language. But my, what, I'd like, what I'm trying to argue is that relation is actually something broader and stranger than this, because semiosis is. Signs exist well beyond the human, and these signs are not always word-like. Thinking with those who think with forests and allowing the forest's thoughts to think their wild ways through us teaches me this. So today I want to briefly explore one kind of relation, play, and an, and an element of, and also, an ele so I want to explore play on the, I'm in the category, I'm in the section of relation. Um, I want to explore play as a kind of relation, and I also want to explore an element of relationship that we don't usually notice, which is absence. So I want to think about these two things. So first, play. By play, I mean a space in which previously tightly coupled means-ends relations are relaxed some, such that s so that something new can emerge. And I think here um, a lot of Donna Haraway's work, um, may her, the example that I always come back to um, in the Companion Species Manifesto of Cayenne and her dog, and her, god, her dog Cayenne and her godson Marco, learning to be in the same game together, learning not to respond in the old ways so that something new can emerge. Um, but one of the things I want to, in, in focusing on play, I want to remind us that means ends relationships are not bad. They are actually in the living world. It's not just something we humans impose on it. When I say that life is semiotic and, I, and that forests think, I'm also saying that function, representation, purpose, and telos are part and partial of the living world. But if we think of means and ends as tightly coupled, as transitive, as deductive, there's no room for something new, no room for growth, no room for flourishing, which of course is also central to life. Growth and thought, as Hannah Arendt teaches us, although in a humanist register, each requires play in this sense. So what happens, I ask, when in Levi-Strauss's formulation, we don't ask thought for a return? This is the kind of play I'm interested in, which gets me to the problem of crisis. In times of crisis, we tend to forget about play. This is as evident in radical politics as it is in the neoliberal takeover of the university, of which I have firsthand evidence as, um, as an ethnographer of McGill University where I teach, where budgets cri budget crises, accountability, benefit to society calculations are closing, closing down spaces for play in ways that kill thought. And thought and politics have an uneasy relationship, as Marilyn Strathern noted. Being intellectually radical can lead to political conservatism, but, politi but being politically radical can lead to intellectual conservatism. We can't question too much if we, we are to act, and that's just how things are. But I think that Donna suggests another way. Our response to crisis, to war, extermination, extinction, and genocide, is not just to respond. Because what our response is, is to struggle to hold open a space for play. A space where call and response need no longer be the only operative logic. So this leads me to absence and its often ignored role in relationality. What does it mean to hold open, to make room for? How is it that a lap for Kaja Silverman or a carrier bag for Ursula Le Guin tell as Ursula Le, Guin, or Ursula Le Guin tells us, how do these things hold open? And by doing so, by holding, do something. What kind of doing is this? And here I think of Gregory Bateson, who writes that in the world of mind, and by mind, he, he's not talking about human minds only, that which is not can be a cause. This absential feature, as Terry Deacon calls it, is central to life and thought. So much of my thinking in Thinking with Forests has been about the strange productive power of absence. What does a bag do? It holds open a space, delimited, constrained, defined not by what is, what is in the bag, we don't know what's gonna end up in that bag, but, but, what, but by what is not, what, what is kept out, what doesn't come in. And I should note that bodies are also bags um, that make room for selves. Um, Life is full of absences, the not yet futures to which we all orient ourselves, the absent dead who make our lives possible, who no longer, who by no longer being here, 
make room for us. So, I mean, there's, I mean, I'm, it's not just about being pro-life, it's about being pro-death. I mean, yeah. we need to die uh, to Especially make room. Especially old rich people. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Especially, yeah. Um, so all of these absences are very important in my thinking. But absences also take the form of not noticing, of confusion. And this too is central to the living thoughts of a thinking forest. Dogs might confuse mountain lions with deer with disastrous, with disastrous results, but results nonetheless. Ticks confuse dogs with mountain lions and deer. And the jaguars we might encounter in the forest might, if we respond correctly, not notice our differences and treat us as one like them. Puma, which I should note is, is a Quechua term. It's the Quechua term for jaguar. Really, it doesn't mean jaguar, the species. It means predator. Or even more accurately, it means something even vaguer, um, more absential. It means an I, a person, one that is not dead, but indebted to all the dead that one is not. The I is a not, an absence, one that is haunted by and held by all the dead. So absences create kinds. Ticks confuse humans, deer, and dogs, and in the process there emerges a kind of being, the kind through which, for example, Lyme disease travels. And becoming with also involves then a kind, right? Um, becoming with also involves becoming a kind, I should say. An anthropology beyond the human is then also an anthropology of the general. That is, it's certainly an anthropology of the mud, but it's also an anthropology of the clean. Logic is not a bad word. It isn't bad, but par part and parcel of the living world, of the living world, generals are, generals are real, signs have certain formal properties. So in that sense, logic is not a bad word, but it isn't just a word. Logic isn't something that we just, that, that just we ling linguistically endowed humans impose on the world. So my th in my thinking about the general, I've thought a lot about the realm of spirits of the forest. This is something that comes up time and again in my ethnography and my work. Um, the forests in the area where I worked are haunted by powerful spirits. These spirits are often white. Um, sometimes they're also pre-Hispanic chiefs, the, the dead ancestors. Um, and there also are those that are no longer present on the landscape, like white-lipped peccary that um, have been overly, uh, locally out-hunted. And deep inside those forests there also lies Aquito. Ecuador is the capital of the Ecuadorian state. And one of the things I'm struck by, and I hope it can come out in, a, in conversation, is a way that another ecology, a legal one, um, the one that Colin uh, writes about so much, so beautifully, how this ecology, the legal ecology, is also haunted by all the ghosts of our colonial pasts. So I'm very interested in this parallel. And I want to I want to bring in someone else in this. Um, the work of Eduardo Vivedo de Castro. Um, he suggests something interesting in a, in a recent piece about fear. I should just a quick aside. Um, I don't think ethnographically only. I mean, I don't only think through what people say in the Amazon as an Amazonist um, do, but they uh, would find the theme of this conference strange because the operative, in some ways, the operative relational uh, concept for us is love. You know, we have our lovers, we have our partners, we, God is love. Um, for Amazonians, the, the operative other is the enemy. Um, the kind of relational ecology that I write about is a predatory one. And it's not exactly the kind of, um, it's not my go-to uh, cosmology for, for the kind of politics I envision. But, um, you know, it does provide, it's, uh, you know, an interesting counter to think why we want to always think about love and, and whether that is, has certain kinds of roots, uh, cultural roots and historically situated roots that, that we might want to question. Um, so anyways, Eduardo Vivero is a cast in a recent piece about fear. Um, 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 suggests something really interesting that I think speaks to Colin's work and how it relates to mine. And he says that the correct parallel for Amerindian relations to those spirits of the forests, to the supernatural, is not our religion or our supernatural, you know, our interest in ESP, the paranormal, or New Age shamanism, as my students always want to insist. That's not the correct parallel. 
Um, it's, the parallel is our everyday experience of existing under a state. That's the parallel to the supernatural. And when the Amazonians are dealing with the spirits of the forest, and I'm not only talking about a colonial inflected relation, uh, but also that, um, they are in some ways relating to something not unlike the, the, the supernatural or the ghosts that haunt our relationship to the state. So with these thoughts about relationality, I want to just turn really briefly, and I'm going to wrap up in two seconds, um, about the kinds of ethical practices we can and should cultivate with other kinds of beings. And this is where I'm sort of at the limits of my thinking. I'm, posing, I'm going to pose a question, but I don't know if it's a, it may be just a non-problem. So let me just put it out there. So I approach this, this question of what obligations, what responsibilities, responsibilities, as Donna calls them, we have toward non-human beings in two ways. But the problem is that these two ways that I'm going to lay out here very briefly don't exactly meet. And this is one of the things I I'd like to talk about. So the first one, one can think of the moral as thinking about the good of others that are not us, right? Um, and so this immediately poses the question, who counts as another? And why should we have obligations to them? So one of the things that I think is so productive and interesting about multi-species thinking is that we can really come to recognize that non-human living beings count as others, other selves, other beings. And I would like to say that's because there are things that are good or bad for them, for their survival. That, that good or bad is intrinsic to their being. There's something that's good for a dog. You might not exactly know, but there is something that's good for a dog. And, and we can't really say that about a rock. <laughs> now, because multi-species relations involve radically other others, as opposed to non-others or non-beings, they become a privileged site for eth an ethical practice in which we're thinking about an other that really isn't us, right? Um, so this, of course, doesn't really tell us how to act. Why is one other better than another? Why is growth and flourishing in general, not just our growth and flourishing, why is that a good thing? So that's the first way in which I think about multi-species relations as an ethical practice. The second one is this, and it's a slightly different one. Um, and I, both, I, sorry, I agree with both, but then I get stuck in trying to combine them. Um, the second one is this. Us, quote unquote, is larger than us humans, right? We are part of a larger we. So think of our microbiomes, the mares from which we extracted our hormone, hormone supplements, even Gaia, perhaps, maybe. Um, we can debate that. Um, so the moral must surely involve care for all of those us to whom we are related in finite mortal knots. But if, if so, isn't our responsibility to those ultimately about us rather than not us? Maybe this is a non-question. Maybe it's just my difficulty. But I can't seem to think my way out of that. Thank you. Um, I'm so glad to be here. There are so many things that I've been worried about and uh, too serious about, perhaps. And so when Eduardo wrote us and said he was going to talk about play, <laughs> I said, well, I'm going to have a hard time. Um, Kept uh, you know, <laughs> the, 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 So I, I want to just begin with uh, the, the point that I guess we're all uh, thinking through, and that, that's where we're living in a time of extinctions. So I, I wanted to begin by asking how we might begin to even speak about what I'm calling commonplace slaughter. And so I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be aware, what Donna calls responsibility. And the thing that has most been unsettling me recently, and this is just a small story, is the ethics that humans believe in and the cruelty that it allows. A dog becomes violent, bears its teeth, and forces my friend to back up against a wall. The dog was rescued from a brutal owner, loved to death by my friend, only to be killed by her in order to save it from itself. So I am up against a problem in thinking um, about what it means to know, about how superiority is enabled, and I think most of all, thinking through Eduardo's work and Donna's work, 
the ruses of, of, of rationalization. Um, and I think what's really important in both their works and what I admire most is a kind of overtly material bias. Um, even the ghostly is amazingly palpable. Every haunt is a bit of matter. And this forces us then, I think, to ask what do we mean when we say something is extraneous? What do we mean when we say something can be disposed? So I am, again, quite worried about certain problematic places when we ask the question, what is it to hold open space for others? And as, as you said, who would those others be? For me, it goes back to worrying about attacks on rural folks who chain their dogs in their yards. I ask myself, is a long chain cooler than a plastic crate? What kind of sensibility demands punishment for the persons and their dogs who happen not to have the money to purchase crates? Or decide that dogs free to run and sniff and walk on the earth is better than confining them to a crate? These are questions that lead me to pick up on what Stephen Palmier, the anthropologist, has called a moral typology. Uh, what he means by that is that there is always, in these kinds of choices and these kinds of questions, a problem about wherein <coughs> we should find our ethics. And one of the things for me that I'm also troubling now is I'm thinking a great deal about, as always, 19th century abolition. and. Uh, making connections between that and certain kinds of animal welfare strategies. What they both have in common, it seems to me, is a certain horror um, of nature. And this is something that someone like Herman Melville understood very well. I'm um, thinking about Moby Dick. And it's in one of the most difficult encounters in the novel, the Grand Armada chapter, he demonstrates how sympathy can simply substitute one hierarchy for another. That the hunter is the sympathizer who takes pity on and performs charity for what is being hunted. The animal still gets killed and mercilessly. So it's almost as if in thinking of this open space, the notion of sympathy is something like icing on the cake of cruelty. It might hide, and this is a big question. Can it hide um, its effects in an excess of feeling? I'm thinking of some of these problematic places because of, for example, the question of terminology, its history, its effects. And I'm, I'm thinking also of the issue of terminology in terms like cruel or vicious or just and kind, because these kinds of transactions are so complicated. And Eduardo's extraordinary call for a place of interaction that might not disqualify taxonomy, but rather transform our understanding of it, seems to allow for a permeability that might lead us to a thoroughgoing reconsideration of the ethical life. The, the invocation of the ethical leads me to, again, a concern with the hard surfaces of life that find articulation in our response to unfamiliar cultural forms. Often in my teaching, especially in undergraduate seminars, I experienced discomfort, both for me and my students, when teaching about a ritual practice that I know as a thoroughgoing discipline of mind and a reaching for ethics, not morality, that I've ever known. And that is animal sacrifice. My experience of it is in Haiti. Um, no one wants to watch a bull chased in a sacred compound in Maya Darren's footage of ceremony in the 1950s. 
or a goat tethered to a tree waiting for its throat to be slit. The question, however, is whether or not this emotional, what, what Palmier calls a moral typology, separates us, closes us off from other modes of being, of thinking through marginality, or thinking through what we think of as barbaric. And so I'm really troubled these days by, as I've always been actually, but terminologies like civilized and barbaric. This dichotomy has always bothered me. In working with pit bulls, type dogs, in seeing the kinds of exterminations that the state is running in order to remove not so much certain pit bulls but their owners, um, I begin to think that maybe we do, as Donna says so beautifully, carry on our backs iteratively an imperial a place of privilege. And I think this place of privilege is experienced in places we might want to avoid or would care most not to hear about. And so I want to end simply by saying that in my opinion, thinking through the ghostliness that the state creates, none other than Blackstone, understood that the social contract itself was a killing off of everything that made you you so that you could become spectral but in reasonable consensus. Um, I, I just want to end by saying ethics, I, I am just putting this on the table for us to discuss, might be something that no longer would uh, cause us to think in ways like right and wrong that we would somehow, ethics would have a meaning that is less abstract, um, less coercive. It would seem to me to have something to do with locale, with the proximity of varying kinds of personhoods um, together. And what is distinctly unfamiliar, what is definitively outside our place of comfort, uh, might be something that can help us to know what it means to be ethical, which is to know how to locate ourselves in, in relation to what we do not know, perhaps maybe a world that is not our own. Um, whereas it seems to me that morality, in the way that I'm meaning it, is an experience of non-relation uh, that doesn't exactly demand us to experience something distasteful or unsettling. Okay, with all that said and all that, the, these issues that I wanted to raise with you today, um, let me just say one more thing. I, I do think that maybe humanism or human, as we've been saying, as we've been hearing in the talks today, is, is, is really a, a, a problem, uh, even an evil and that we might want to start thinking um, about the nuances of animality. And so I want to end with a bit of a poem that has always interested me. It's William Carlos Williams Patterson. It is a remarkable failure uh, in what it attempts to do. Um, he knows that there's more to the idea of a dog than an Eliot's dog, you know, digging in the dirt. And he wants to demonstrate throughout Patterson, I think, that death and dogs bring us to another way of cognition. And to a certain extent, he understood how, for him at least, we could learn something rock bottom about how we come to know and when we ought to care. So it's a poem that questions human cruelty and poetic mastery by embracing, as he says, the foulness. And he fills Patterson with dogs. They're alive. They're peeing in the park that prohibits them. And he has these amazing dark ellipses across his pages that you know, are definitely fecal motives. I mean, you know, they're turds. They do to the poem what a piece of shit might do 
uh, to a nice and elegant artifact. The poem begins with a preface that recalls uh, a great deal that I think all of us have been saying, to make a start out of particulars and make them general, rolling, up the sum by defective means, sniffing the trees, just another dog among a lot of dogs. And then he ends, listen, this is to you, the forest, the pouring water, the dogs and trees, conspire to invent a world. Gone. Bow wow. <laughs> so, and here we are. Um, I was thinking that the, uh, initially the three of us, the time uh, compression will be different, but just the three of us should have a chance to speak a little bit to what we said and then, immediate, and then open things up quickly um, to a larger conversation. Um, with folks here. Okay, then I'll start and ask you, Don, yeah. what happened? Did you walk with Cayenne? I decided that Cayenne and I both were too ignorant about the, uh, civ the questions of civil encounter mm -hmm. and that the, the dogs um, in the parking lot, so-called reservation dogs, lived there and belonged there and were savvy and might not particularly appreciate a rather fe fearful elderly dog and her rather fearful elderly human mediated by a leash. So we decided to enjoy the dogs in the parking lot and not subject Cayenne and them to each other. Okay. And I think all the people were relieved about that decision. If we were there a longer period of time, that might be a different issue. But this was, uh, no, we, we didn't. And um, I, the, dogs have histories. It isn't just, uh, you know, there's not such a thing as dog nature, and then only people have histories. But dogs have histories, which is part of the response to that, uh, which, by which I mean um, they and we are shaped by the histories of the land and people and we are shaped by many temporalities of, of living mm. and that uh, Cayenne and I, I'm not kidding when I say we are creatures of empire mm. and that is not a statement that evokes guilt. Mm. It's a statement that asks very particular questions about the practice of tourism mm -hmm. in 2013 mm -hmm. in the Navajo Nation, mm -hmm. in Diné Bekeya, in Diné Ta, mm -hmm. in the Hopi Mesas, with all those who live there, mm -hmm. um, and watching what happens when the Hubble Trading Post becomes a particular uh, kind of federal monument mm -hmm. run by the, by the Navajo tribal Mm. Uh, government while Goulding's is still a commercial enterprise with very different relations. And all of this involves the sheep, the people, the dogs, the acts of ordinary tourism. Mm -hmm. So no, we didn't. And it had to do with trying to figure out how to be a tourist inheriting all of that mm -hmm. in the flesh. Both of our flesh. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and not just ours. Everybody in that parking lot was inheriting these multiple histories mm. of pastoral economies, herding economies, um, mm. uh, wool commercialism, the relationships of dogs to the whole scene, and then the current massive problem of overpopulation of reservation dogs, uh, which has, among other things, to do with loss of jobs for those very dogs. <laughs> no, we decided not to walk in that scene. So my my challenge with I'm I completely a, a agree with that way of seeing things of of seeing all of us in these relationships in placed in a very complex history. But my my challenge I mean the challenge for me in thinking this way is to also <clears throat> recognize that there are also certain kinds of relations that don't have history, in the sense of saying. What's an example for you? An example for me, an example, uh, let me, let me I, that's the right way to answer is with an example, but let me, let me not do that. We'll do that later. <laughs> um, what I mean by this is to say that it's true that we're, we're made in, 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 in contexts 
um, in these sorts of ways. But there are other things that happen that emerge that aren't context made. Um, hist histories, in the, as you, in this way, are are the product of context-like phenomena. That's, um, but there are certain kinds of communicative response, communicate forms of communication that aren't historically latent. Yeah, of course we live in. I mean, you can't just make that history go away, and you certainly, you can you certainly can ignore it at your peril. I mean, that's the danger. The danger is is, is to ignore that history. So I, I, I well, but, but so so yeah. I so I appreciate that we have to do this kind of work, but at, in doing that work, I think we also have to sort of make room for the possibility of things that aren't held that way. Like, for example, I can't like, imagine. Uh, uh, you know, I would love to hear a com a place, a locale where you could have an experience that wouldn't. I mean, I would think, I mean, I'm in the realm of the hypotheticals, but I would think that there are certain things in that parking lot that are not just historically made, certain relationships between Cayenne and those dogs that were happening that are not always in this, at the same time that they also are. We're using the word history differently. We've, we've uh, in, uh, introduced an ambiguity in the key word. Okay. Uh, be, because, uh, and I would agree with you in, in, that, in yeah. that meaning as I hear it, that a whole lot of things were going on in that parking lot that had to do with, um, well, let's just take uh, 13 and a half year old, you know, a little, little bit hard of hearing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, very human focused, uh, traveling dog, and a community of dogs who live there who were free mm -hmm. uh, and curious and mm -hmm. hanging out and yeah. not being sure what would happen and, qu and right. not really wanting anything bad to happen for anybody's sake. Right. Um, the dogs are going to be communicating with each other through um, scent, sight mm -hmm. of their social, their social history with each other in that place or lack of same. Mm -hmm. All sorts of things that don't have anything directly to do with the way I told the history of right. um, pastoralism mm -hmm. in, in that particular place. Yeah. Sort of. But then then the question of, of um, ahumanism, not anti-humanism, mm. but ahumanism immediately enters the issue of what counts as history. Mm. So if the, uh, I agree with you, for example, about logic and formalism mm. and the formal properties mm. of communicative acts and mm. so on and so on, and I think they are enabled by the evolutionary history of bacteria. Mm. I think that anything interesting, um, that, that language is, uh, the, the possibility of recognition itself mm -hmm. rec uh, and the possibility of linguistic difference is a bacterial gift mm -hmm. to the planet mm -hmm. because their semiotic exuberance is absolutely out of control and has been for a few billion years. Ecstasy. Uh, that there's almost no, uh, that the elements that have been recombined ever since, including in the mm -hmm. uh, the active sites on neur the recognition sites of neurons, the various emergent properties of brains, the the various uh, when um, one of our speakers earlier didn't know whether to call something smell, it was Neil, uh, because of the way those molecules are wafting around at the tips of antennae on those mosquitoes. Do you call that smell? Well, it depends upon whether you are singing a hymn to the chemical exuberance of bacteria who invented these molecules for recognition in the first place, mm -hmm. and that have been recombined ever after, with a few new ones, it's true. There have been a few things that, that have, you know, there is new stuff on the planet, but, the, but that kind of constantly mm -hmm. reworking the bacterial inheritance, complex cells themselves, developmental programs, probably the fact that we're placental mammals rather than not, on and on we go. Um, the evolution of language itself is a bacterial gift. Mm -hmm. Well, why not call that history? Why, why reserve history mm -hmm. for those things that human beings do? Mm -hmm. uh, so you think, you ask about how forests think, and I ask about, and I'm serious too, mm -hmm. how forests do history. Mm -hmm. By which I don't just mean the arrival of the Spanish, or the, right. or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Or, but yes. I actually mean the evolution of the chemosensory apparatuses mm -hmm. of some trees compared to others. Mm -hmm and the way that gets worked into the socialities of, mm -hmm. um, let's say, the, the various species mm -hmm. of bees who might be in play in that particular region, and what happens to their honeys, and 
who makes use of which resources, and there are going to be all kinds of formal properties mm -hmm. in that. Um, there are going to be some functionality, some yeah. non-functionalities. There are going to be zones of, there are going to be degrees of freedom, call that holding open space for play mm -hmm. in, a, in systems thinking. Yeah. Uh, I'm really, really interested in taking the key feminist terms, thought, history, uh, all, you know, the key feminist lexicon and being serious about doing it um, in, in, a, in a crowd of critters. In a trans species. Uh, in a tra in where transfection is the name of the game. I'm really, really interested in what goes on transing. Where, of course, lineage matters, mm -hmm. but it's a wrinkle on a much tra more transy story. Okay? What happens if kinship is the, linear kinship is the exception? Right. And the right. rule is the formal properties of trans. The rule is mm. the apparatuses yeah. of transing, which bacteria gifted us with, right. you know, uh, et cetera, and so on. So, I'm re I, I, so in that sense, I say, no, we really need to learn how to think history. Uh -huh. In another sense, yeah. Uh, yeah, of course. Can I say something? Uh, Absolutely. Just, so, I guess, I think there's one, maybe one way one way to think about history in this larger, not just humanist sense, is to say that we obviously, we need to be aware of so many effects of the past on the present or contingency um, in making. The presence of the past in the present. The, the ongoingness yes. of it. Yes. And it's not an it. Yeah. But there, but, and I, I don't at all deny that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, yes. Um, but the one thing I want to hold out for is things that aren't always made that way. And I think I, now, you know, to getting to formal properties. I, I think, and this is, is that. You have much more love of form than I do. There's I no know, question it's terrible. Yeah. It's <laughs> terrible. <laughs> That's terrible. But, no, it's but, perfectly but I, good. But, so I, good also, thing is I, but I, I strive to do it uh, ethnographically. And when I mean ethnographic is engage with the world. I don't. You do. Um, um, so m my point is that there are things that I think that there are certain formal properties of semiosis that would happen on other planets with other contingent happen uh, other contingent histories that might that would give the same formal properties would come out not that that is the only interesting thing it certainly is not um, and to reduce things to that would uh, be uninteresting I think that's analytically true I mm -hmm. think one but I'm inter I want to ask Colin to come in on that on the <laughs> question of proximity yeah uh, the um, I Agree that these are an, that um, th these are abstractions. These formal properties mm -hmm. that are that are precious acquisitions. You know that that abstractions are built. They're they're incredibly precious achievements. Mm -hmm. Abstractions that can make those analytical moves. Mm -hmm. Now, and that analytical moves so are analytical moves or abstractions. The force analytical moves. Hmm? The forest analytical moves? Or the worlds. Are, the worlds. Uh, the, worlds, the, worlds. Uh, the world, yes, right. well, yeah. and, and we linguistically produce um, we're, we're, yeah, we're and mathematically produce yeah. uh, formal apparatuses sure. for writing it down. Right, right, right. right but yeah. we didn't invent the moves. Yeah. Um, but the proximities did. I, I think. Yeah, I think that the problem is I, I would try to build. I mean, from the ground up, I mean, I think that the framework is what I have to take issue with. Mm. Uh, you, you, you're, but, you know, your question, I, Donna's wanting to hold on to a term like history, mm. I think is so crucial because of the idea of holding on to the things that might seem inimical to the project we're about, given that we are in a space where those terms really do have to be, in some sense, reinvented or questioned. Mm -hmm. So, you know, ethics is the one that you, the you paid most that's attention the ethics, to. Ethics, you know, the, the mm -hmm. idea of finding an ethics and what might seem to deny it mm -hmm. seems to me very, very important in situations or, con you know, the concreteness is, I think, what Donna was speaking about, in my opinion, I mean, what I was thinking when she said, but we're carrying this history. We're not going to walk down the street. You know, because energy, history, it's in whatever you're thinking, sensing, whatever Donna could feel in her mind at that point. 
it was shared with Cayenne, mm -hmm. and it put them in a very distinct place mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. what they were entering into. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, I, I just think my experience with training uh, is a different, you know, mm -hmm. kind of on the ground. So mm -hmm. when I'm thinking of an ethics, I'm, I'm trying to arrive at a place where we actually uh, kind of let in uh, the problem mm -hmm. into the space of an academy that conceptually defangs thought. I mean, so, you know, much of what you were saying about thinking beyond the human, mm -hmm. the mud, but that doesn't mean that there's not, you know, that you have mud, but that doesn't mean that there's not something clean as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and something you were saying earlier about taxonomy seemed mm -hmm. to me very, very important. We're really uncomfortable with the idea of hierarchy, and we want to negate it or remove it. But as you show in your work, the hierarchy is, is there, but it's not the way we mean it. And I, mm -hmm. so I, Could I, I, I um, you know, I, I, you were uncomfortable initially, you told that funny story, about you, that you were initially uncomfortable with play as yes. being a really central mm -hmm. thing. And, I, yeah. and then you went, on to, but right you went on to characterize ethics as um, that kind of somehow um, inhabiting these proximities uh, without the surety of right and wrong, the kind of, that ethics is a, mm -hmm. is a profoundly experimental um, ambiguous, uh, an experimental practice with consequences, and that there's no way to to engage ethics foundationally, but only proximally, or only from within the proximities. And it seems to me that that there's a way. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to propose right. this as a way of okay. tying the three of us together yeah. and then throwing it open. It's by going yeah. to Mark Beckoff. Mm -hmm. who argued that the evolutionary possibility of ethics is rooted in play and not prohibition. Mm -hmm. Specifically, that critters who play, mm -hmm. uh, and many critters play, and often across species difference, mm -hmm. inappropriate play is especially interesting mm -hmm. because it exposes critters to vulnerabilities that they might not normally experience in mm -hmm. their heteronormative developmental windows. Mm -hmm. Uh, or whatever, you know, that, mm. that critters, cross-species play is often particularly interesting because predators and prey, predator and prey critters might play with each other. Mm. Adult predator and prey critters might learn to play with each other as adults and what happens in that invention. He thinks such things are the, at the evolutionary root of ethics, mm. by which he means these engaging in, you know, from the repertoire, you know, mm -hmm. isn't there something about that encounter that isn't about history? Mm -hmm. <coughs> from repertoires that are there, maybe from bi mainly biobehavioral history, mm -hmm. and chemical history, and so forth history. From the repertoires uh, that uh, were put into play in the birthing of those critters, and they're growing up in those situations, and then they met each other, and something, uh, something like a question who are you and so who are we, mm -hmm. was worked out in taking the risk of a play battle mm -hmm. to an inappropriate creature. Mm -hmm. And that inappropriate critter responding appropriately enough to allow a chase that resulted in something we may as well call joy rather than lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that something happened. A space was held open for something that was not yet. Oh. And that something that was not yet was invented and it never mm -hmm. existed on, that plan on this planet before. Mm -hmm. It really hadn't been on Earth before. Something new happened. Mm -hmm. And out of that, the playing critters mm -hmm. build rituals, build languages, build repertoires, mm -hmm. build further vulnerabilities, mm -hmm. build languages, build ethics. Out of, out of that risk of play, the possibility of seriousness with each mm -hmm. other, indifference, not carrying it on our mm -hmm. backs, but indifference is just maybe barely possible. Something not yet may yet happen. In the face of ongoing extermination and extinction, that's my only sense of optimism. Right. Okay, call that holding open the space for play. Yeah. yeah. And it's a system property. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's an interesting, I think it's Peter Wilson um, who wrote on domestication. Uh, 
for him, the dom domestication is creating sp in our enclosures. They're like carrier bags where you create uh, uh, animal domestication, where there's certain, I mean, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I'm not so down there's a sense, but, but there's but a sense of uh, yeah. holding open a space as, as a, as a for inappropriate cohabitation, call that domestication. Something like that. But we should open anyway. It we should up. open it up. Let's open <laughs> that opening. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, my, my glasses. Yeah, so. uh, Carlin, you should uh, control the, the the questions. <laughs>